Section five of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn. Dust. Let the Bodhisattva look upon all things as having the nature of space, as permanently equal to space, without essence, without substantiality. Sadharma Pundarika. I have wandered on the verge of the town, and the street I followed has roughened into a country road, and begins to curve away through rice fields toward a hamlet at the foot of the hills. Between town and rice fields, a vague, unoccupied stretch of land makes a favorite playground for children. There are trees, and spaces of grass to roll on, and many butterflies, and plenty of little stones. I stop to look at the children. By the roadside, some are amusing themselves with wet clay, making tiny models of mountains and rivers and rice fields, tiny mud villages also, imitations of peasants' huts, and little mud temples, and mud gardens with ponds and humped bridges, and imitations of stone lanterns, toro. Likewise, miniature cemeteries with bits of broken stone for monuments. And they play at funerals, bearing corpses of butterflies and semi, cicada, and pretending to repeat Buddhist sutras over the grave. Tomorrow they will not dare to do this, for tomorrow will be the first day of the festival of the dead. During that festival it is strictly forbidden to molest insects, especially semi, some of which have on their heads little red characters, said to be names of souls. Children in all countries play at death. Before the sense of personal identity comes, death cannot be seriously considered, and childhood thinks in this regard more correctly, perhaps, than self-conscious maturity. Of course, if these little ones were told, some bright morning, that a playfellow had gone away for ever, gone away to be reborn elsewhere, there would be a very real, though vague, sense of loss, and much wiping of eyes, with many-colored sleeves. But presently the loss would be forgotten, and the playing resumed." The idea of ceasing to exist could not possibly enter a child mind. The butterflies and birds, the flowers, the foliage, the sweet summer itself, only play at dying. They seem to go, but they all come back again after the snow is gone. The real sorrow and fear of death arise in us only through slow accumulation of experience with doubt and pain, and these little boys and girls, being Japanese and Buddhists, will never, in any event, feel about death just as you or I do. They will find reason to fear it for somebody else's sake, but not for their own, because they will learn that they have died millions of times already, and have forgotten the trouble of it, much as one forgets the pain of successive toothaches. In the strangely penetrant light of their creed, teaching the ghostliness of all substance, granite or gossamer, just as those lately found x-rays make visible the ghostliness of the flesh, this their present world, with its bigger mountains and rivers and rice fields, will not appear to them much more real than the mud landscapes which they made in childhood, and much more real it probably is not. At which thought I am conscious of a sudden shock, a familiar shock, and know myself seized by the idea of substance as non-reality. This sense of the voidness of things comes only when the temperature of the air is so equably related to the temperature of life that I can forget having a body. Cold compels painful notions of solidity. Cold sharpens the delusion of personality. Cold quickens egotism. Cold numbs thought and shrivels up the little wings of dreams. Today is one of those warm, hushed days when it is possible to think of things as they are, when ocean, peak, and plain seem no more real than the arching of blue emptiness above them. All is mirage, my physical self, and the sunlit road, and the slow rippling of the grain under a sleepy wind, and the thatched roofs beyond the haze of the rice fields, and the blue crumpling of the naked hills behind everything. I have the double sensation of being myself a ghost, and of being haunted, haunted by the prodigious luminous specter of the world. There are men and women working in these fields. Colored moving shadows they are, and the earth under them, 
out of which they rose, and back to which they will go, is equally shadow. Only the forces behind the shadow, that make and unmake, are real, therefore viewless. Somewhat as night devours all lesser shadow, will this phantasmal earth swallow us at last, and itself thereafter vanish away. But the little shadows, and the shadow-eater, must as certainly reappear, must rematerialize somewhere and somehow. This ground beneath me is old as the Milky Way. Call it what you please. Clay, soil, dust. Its names are but symbols of human sensations having nothing in common with it. Really, it is nameless and unnameable, being a mass of energies, tendencies, infinite possibilities, for it was made by the beating of that shoreless sea of birth and death, whose surges billow unseen out of eternal night to burst in foam of stars. Lifeless it is not. It feeds upon life, and visible life grows out of it. Dust it is of karma, waiting to enter into novel combinations, dust of elder being in that state between birth and birth which the Buddhist calls Chu U. It is made of forces, and of nothing else, and those forces are not of this planet only, but of vanished spheres innumerable. Is there aught visible, tangible, measurable, that has never been mixed with sentiency? Atom that has never vibrated to pleasure or to pain? Air that has never been cry or speech? Drop that has never been a tear? Assuredly this dust has felt. It has been everything we know, also much that we cannot know. It has been nebula and star, planet and moon, times unspeakable. Deity also it has been, the sun god of worlds that circled and worshipped in other aeons. Remember, man, thou art but dust, a saying profound only as materialism, which stops short at surfaces. For what is dust? Remember, dust, thou hast been sun, and sun thou shalt become again. Thou hast been light, life, love, and into all these, by ceaseless cosmic magic, thou shalt many times be turned again. For this cosmic apparition is more than evolution alternating with dissolution. It is infinite metempsychosis, it is perpetual palingenesis. Those old predictions of a bodily resurrection were not falsehoods, they were rather foreshadowings of a truth vaster than all myths and deeper than all religions. Suns yield up their ghosts of flame, but out of their graves new suns rush into being. Corpses of worlds pass all to some solar funeral pyre, but out of their own ashes they are born again. This earth must die, her seas shall be Sahara's, but those seas once existed in the sun, and their dead tides, revived by fire, will pour their thunder upon the coasts of another world. Transmigration, transmutation, these are not fables. What is impossible? Not the dreams of alchemists and poets. Dross indeed may be changed to gold, the jewel to the living eye, the flower into flesh. What is impossible? If seas can pass from world to sun, from sun to world again, what of the dust of dead selves, dust of memory and thought? Resurrection there is, but a resurrection more stupendous than any dreamed of by Western creeds. Dead emotions will revive as surely as dead suns and moons. Only, so far as we can just now discern, there will be no return of identical individualities." The reapparition will always be a recombination of the pre-existing, a readjustment of affinities, a reintegration of being informed with the experience of anterior being. The cosmos is a karma. Merely by reason of illusion and folly do we shrink from the notion of self-instability. For what is our individuality? Most certainly it is not individuality at all. It is multiplicity incalculable. What is the human body? a form built up out of billions of living entities, an impermanent agglomeration of individuals called cells, and the human soul, a composite of quintillions of souls. We are, each and all, infinite compounds of fragments of anterior lives, and the universal process that continually dissolves and continually constructs personality has always been going on, and is even at this moment going on, in every one of us. What being ever had a totally new feeling, 
an absolutely new idea all our emotions and thoughts and wishes however changing and growing through the varying seasons of life are only compositions and recompositions of the sensations and ideas and desires of other folk mostly of dead people millions of billions of dead people cells and souls are themselves recombinations present aggregations of past knittings of forces forces about which nothing is known save that they belong to the shadow makers of universes whether you by you i mean any other agglomeration of souls really wish for immortality as an agglomeration i cannot tell but i confess that my mind to me a kingdom is not rather it is a fantastical republic daily troubled by more revolutions than ever occurred in south america and the nominal government supposed to be rational declares that an eternity of such anarchy is not desirable i have souls wanting to soar in air and souls wanting to swim in water sea water i think and souls wanting to live in woods or on mountain tops i have souls longing for the tumult of great cities and souls longing to dwell in tropical solitude souls also in various degrees of naked savagery souls demanding nomad freedom without tribute souls conservative delicate loyal to empire and to feudal tradition and souls that are nihilists deserving siberia sleepless souls hating inaction and hermit souls dwelling in such meditative isolation that only at intervals of years can i feel them moving about souls that have faith in fetishes polytheistic souls souls proclaiming islam and souls medieval loving cloister shadow and incense and glimmer of tapers and the awful altitude of gothic glooms cooperation among all these is not to be thought of always there will be trouble revolt confusion civil war the majority detest this state of things multitudes would gladly emigrate and the wiser minority feel that they need never hope for better conditions until after the total demolition of the existing social structure i an individual an individual soul nay i am a population a population unthinkable for multitude even by groups of a thousand millions generations of generations i am eons of eons countless times the concourse now making me has been scattered and mixed with other scatterings of what concern then the next disintegration perhaps after trillions of ages of burning in different dynasties of suns the very best of me may come together again if one could only imagine some explanation of the why the questions of the whence and the whither are much less troublesome since the present assures us even though vaguely of future and past but the why the cooing voice of a little girl dissolves my reverie she is trying to teach a child brother how to make the chinese character for man i mean man with a big m first she draws in the dust a stroke sloping downwards from right to left so and then she draws another curving downwards from left to right thus joining the two so as to form the perfect g or character hito meaning a person of either sex or mankind then she tries to impress the idea of this shape on the baby memory by help of a practical illustration probably learned at school she breaks a slip of wood into two pieces and manages to balance the pieces against each other at about the same angle as that made by the two strokes of the character now see she says each stands only by help of the other one by itself cannot stand therefore the g is like mankind without help one person cannot live in this world but by getting help and giving help everybody can live if nobody helped anybody all people would fall down and die this explanation is not philologically exact the two strokes evolutionally stand for a pair of legs all that survives in the modern ideograph of the whole man figured in the primitive picture writing but the pretty moral fancy is much more important than the scientific fact 
it is also one charming example of that old-fashioned method of teaching which invested every form and every incident with ethical significance besides as a mere item of moral information it contains the essence of all earthly religion and the best part of all earthly philosophy a world priestess she is this dear little maid with her dove's voice and her innocent gospel of one letter verily in that gospel lies the only possible present answer to ultimate problems were its whole meaning universally felt were its whole suggestion of the spiritual and material law of love and help universally obeyed forthwith according to the idealists this seemingly solid visible world would vanish away like smoke for it has been written that in whatsoever time all human minds accord in thought and will with the mind of the teacher there shall not remain even one particle of dust that does not enter into buddhahood end of section five section six of gleanings in buddha fields this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn. About Faces in Japanese Art. 1. A very interesting essay upon the Japanese art collections in the National Library was read by Mr. Edward Strange at a meeting of the Japan Society held last year in London. Mr. Strange proved his appreciation of Japanese art by an exposition of its principles, the subordination of detail to the expression of a sensation or idea, the subordination of the particular to the general. He spoke especially of the decorative element in Japanese art, and of the ukiyoyi school of color printing. He remarked that even the heraldry of Japan, as illustrated in little books costing only a few pence each, contained an education in the planning of conventional ornament. He referred to the immense industrial value of Japanese stencil designs. He tried to explain the nature of the advantage likely to be gained in the art of book illustration from the careful study of Japanese methods. And he indicated the influence of those methods in the work of such artists as Aubrey Beardsley, Edgar Wilson, Steinlin Ibbles, Whistler, Grasset, Charret, and Lantrec. Finally, he pointed out the harmony between certain Japanese principles and the doctrines of one of the modern Western schools of Impressionism. Such an address could hardly fail to provoke adverse criticism in England, because it suggested a variety of new ideas. English opinion does not prohibit the importation of ideas. The public will even complain if fresh ideas be not regularly set before it. But its requirement of them is aggressive. It wants to have an intellectual battle over them to persuade its unquestioning acceptance of new beliefs or thoughts, to coax it to jump to a conclusion, were about as easy as to make the mountains skip like rams. Though willing to be convinced, providing the idea does not appear morally dangerous, it must first be assured of the absolute correctness of every step in the mental process by which the novel conclusion has been reached. That Mr. Strange's just but almost enthusiastic admiration of japanese art could pass without challenge was not possible yet one would scarcely have anticipated a challenge from the ranks of the japan society itself the report however shows that mr strange's views were received even by that society in the characteristic english way the idea that english artists could learn anything important from the study of japanese methods was practically pooh pooed and the criticisms made by various members indicated that the philosophic part of the paper had been either misunderstood or unnoticed. One gentleman innocently complained that he could not imagine why Japanese art should be utterly wanting in facial expression. Another declared that there could never have been any lady like the ladies of the Japanese prince, and he described their faces thereon portrayed as absolutely insane. Then came the most surprising incident of the evening— the corroboration of these adverse criticisms by his excellency the japanese minister with the apologetic remark that the prince referred to were only regarded as common things in japan common things common perhaps in the judgment of other generations aesthetic luxuries to-day the artists named were hokusai toyokuni hiroshiji kuniyoshi kunisada 
but his excellency seemed to think the subject trifling for he took occasion to call away the attention of the meeting irrelevantly as patriotically to the triumphs of the war in this he reflected faithfully the japanese zeitgeist which can scarcely now endure the foreign praise of japanese art unfortunately those dominated by the just and natural martial pride of the hour do not reflect that while the developments and maintenance of great armaments unless effected with the greatest economical caution might lead in short order to national bankruptcy the future industrial prosperity of the country is likely to depend in no small degree upon the conservation and cultivation of the national art sense nay those very means by which japan won her late victories were largely purchased by the commercial results of that very art sense to which his excellency seemed to attach no importance japan must continue to depend upon her aesthetic faculty even in so commonplace a field of industry as the manufacture of mattings for a mere cheap production she will never be able to undersell china two although the criticisms provoked by mr strange's essay were unjust to japanese art they were natural and indicated nothing worse than ignorance of that art and miscomprehension of its purpose it is not an art of which the meaning can be read at a glance years of study are necessary for a right comprehension of it i cannot pretend that i have mastered the knowledge of its moods and tenses but i can say truthfully that the faces in the old picture books and in the cheap prints of to-day especially those of the illustrated japanese newspapers do not seem to me in the least unreal much less absolutely insane there was a time when they did appear to me fantastic now i find them always interesting occasionally beautiful if i am told that no other european would say so then i must declare all other europeans wrong i feel sure that if these faces seem to most occidentalists either absurd or soulless it is only because most occidentalists do not understand them and even if his excellency the japanese minister to england be willing to accept the statement that no japanese woman ever resembled the women of the japanese picture books and cheap prints i must still refuse to do so those pictures i contend are true and reflect intelligence grace and beauty i see the women of the japanese picture books in every japanese street i have beheld in actual life almost every normal type of face to be found in a japanese picture book the child and the girl the bride and the mother the matron and the grandparent poor and rich charming or commonplace or vulgar if i am told that trained art critics who have lived in japan laugh at this assertion i reply that they cannot have lived in japan long enough or felt her life intimately enough or studied her art impartially enough to qualify themselves to understand even the commonest japanese drawing before i came to japan i used to be puzzled by the absence of facial expression in certain japanese pictures i confess that the faces although not even then devoid of a certain weird charm seemed to me impossible afterwards during the first two years of far eastern experience that period in which the stranger is apt to imagine that he is learning all about a people whom no occidental can ever really understand i could recognize the grace and truth of certain forms and feel something of the intense charm of color in japanese prints but i had no perception of the deeper meaning of that art even the full significance of its color i did not know much that was simply true i then thought outlandish while conscious of the charm of many things the reason of the charm i could not guess i imagined the apparent conventionalism of the faces to indicate the arrested development of an otherwise marvelous art faculty it never occurred to me that they might be conventional only in the sense of symbols which once interpreted would reveal more than ordinary western drawing can express but this was because i still remained under old barbaric influences influences that blinded me to the meaning of japanese drawing and now having at last learned a little it is the western art of illustration that appears to me conventional undeveloped semi-barbarous the pictorial attractions of english weeklies and of american magazines now impress me as flat coarse and clumsy my opinion on the subject however is limited to the ordinary class of western illustration as compared with the ordinary class of japanese prints perhaps somebody will say that even granting my assertion the meaning of any true art should need no interpretation 
and that the inferior character of Japanese work is proved by the admission that its meaning is not universally recognizable. Whoever makes such a criticism must imagine Western art to be everywhere equally intelligible. Some of it, the very best, probably is, and some Japanese art also is. But I can assure the reader that the ordinary art of Western book illustration or magazine engraving is just as incomprehensible to Japanese as Japanese drawings are to Europeans who have never seen Japan. For a Japanese to understand our common engravings, he must have lived abroad. For an Occidental to perceive the truth, or the beauty, or the humor of Japanese drawings, he must know the life which those drawings reflect. One of the critics at the meeting of the Japan Society found fault with the absence of facial expression in Japanese drawing as conventional. He compared Japanese art on this ground with the art of the old Egyptians, and held both inferior because restricted by convention. Yet surely the age which makes Laokoan a classic ought to recognize that Greek art itself was not free from conventions. It was an art which we can scarcely hope ever to equal, but it was more conventional than any existing form of art, and since it proved that even the divine could find development within the limits of artistic convention, the charge of formality is not a charge worth making against Japanese art. Somebody may respond that Greek conventions were conventions of beauty, while those of Japanese drawing have neither beauty nor meaning, but such a statement is possible only because Japanese art has not yet found its Winkleman or its Lessing, whereas Greek art, by the labor of generations of modern critics and teachers, has been made somewhat more comprehensible to us than it could have been to our barbarian forefathers. The Greek conventional face cannot be found in real life no living head presenting so large a facial angle, but the Japanese conventional face can be seen everywhere when once the real value of its symbol in art is properly understood. The face of Greek art represents an impossible perfection, a superhuman evolution. The seemingly inexpressive face drawn by the Japanese artists represents the living, the actual, the everyday. The former is a dream, the latter is a common fact. 3. A partial explanation of the apparent physiognomical conventionalism in Japanese drawing is just that law of subordination of individualism to type, of personality to humanity, of detail to feeling, which the miscomprehended lecturer, Mr. Edward Strange, vainly tried to teach the Japan Society something about. The Japanese artist depicts an insect, for example, as no European artist can do. He makes it live. He shows its peculiar motion its character, everything by which it is at once distinguished as a type, and all this with a few brush-strokes. But he does not attempt to represent every vein upon each of its wings, every separate joint of its antenna. He depicts it as it is really seen at a glance, not as studied in detail. We never see all the details of the body of a grasshopper, a butterfly, or a bee in the moment that we perceive it, perching somewhere. We observe only enough to enable us to decide what kind of creature it is. We see the typical, never the individual peculiarities. Therefore the Japanese artist paints the type alone. To reproduce every detail would be to subordinate the type character to the individual peculiarity. A very minute detail is rarely brought out except when the instant recognition of the type is aided by the recognition of the detail. As, for example, when a ray of light happens to fall upon the joint of a cricket's leg, or to reverberate from the mail of a dragonfly in a double-colored metallic flash. So likewise in painting a flower, the artist does not depict a particular, but a typical flower. He shows the morphological law of the species, or, to speak symbolically, nature's thought behind the form. The results of this method may astonish even scientific men. Alfred Russell Wallace speaks of a collection of Japanese sketches of plants as the most masterly things that he ever saw. Every stem, twig, and leaf, he declares, is produced by simple touches of the brush, the character and perspective of very complicated plants being admirably given, and the articulations of stem and leaves shown in a most scientific manner. The italics are my own. Observe that while the work is simplicity itself, produced by single touches of the brush, it is nevertheless, in the opinion of one of the greatest living naturalists, most scientific. And why? because it shows the type character and the law of the type. So again, in portraying rocks and cliffs, hills and plains, 
the japanese artist gives us the general character not the wearisome detail of masses and yet the detail is admirably suggested by this perfect study of the larger law or look at his color studies of sunsets and sunrises he never tries to present every minute fact within range of vision but offers us only those great luminous tones and chromatic blendings which after a thousand petty details have been forgotten still linger in the memory and there recreate the feeling of what has been seen now this general law of the art applies to japanese representations of the human figure and also though here other laws come into play of the human face the general types are given and often with a force that the cleverest french sketcher could scarcely emulate the personal trait the individual peculiarity is not given even when in the humor of caricature or in dramatic representation facial expression is strongly marked it is rendered by typical not individual characteristics just as it was rendered upon the antique stage by the conventional masks of greek actors four a few general remarks about the treatment of faces in ordinary japanese drawing may help to the understanding of what that treatment teaches youth is indicated by the absence of all but essential touches and by the clean smooth curves of the face and neck excepting the touches which suggest eyes nose and mouth there are no lines the curves speak sufficiently of fullness smoothness ripeness for story illustration it is not necessary to elaborate feature as the age or condition is indicated by the style of the coiffure and the fashion of the dress in female figures the absence of eyebrows indicates the wife or widow a straggling tress signifies grief troubled thought is shown by an unmistakable pose or gesture hair costume and attitude are indeed enough to explain almost everything but the japanese artist knows how by means of extremely delicate variations in the direction and position of the half dozen touches indicating feature to give some hint of character whether sympathetic or unsympathetic and this hint is seldom lost upon a japanese eye again an almost imperceptible hardening or softening of these touches has moral significance still this is never individual it is only the hint of a physiognomical law in the case of immature youth boy and girl faces there is merely a general indication of softness and gentleness the abstract rather than the concrete charm of childhood in the portrayal of maturer types the lines are more numerous and more accentuated illustrating the fact that character necessarily becomes more marked in middle age as the facial muscles begin to show but there is only the suggestion of this change not any study of individualism in the representation of old age the japanese artist gives us all the wrinkles the hollows the shrinking of tissues the crow's feet the gray hairs the change in the line of the face following upon loss of teeth his old men and women show character they delight us by a certain worn sweetness of expression a look of benevolent resignation or they repel us by an aspect of hardened cunning avarice or envy there are many types of old age but they are types of human conditions not of personality the picture is not drawn from a model it is not the reflection of an individual existence its value is made by the recognition which it exhibits of a general physiognomical or biological law here it is worth while to notice that the reserves of japanese art in the matter of facial expression accord with the ethics of oriental society for ages the rule of conduct has been to mask all personal feelings as far as possible to hide pain and passion under an exterior semblance of smiling amiability or of impassive resignation one key to the enigmas of japanese art is buddhism five i have said that when i now look at a foreign illustrated newspaper or magazine i can find little pleasure in the engravings most often they repel me the drawing seems to me coarse and hard and the realism of the conception petty such work leaves nothing to the imagination and usually betrays the effort which it cost a common japanese drawing leaves much to the imagination nay irresistibly stimulates it and never betrays effort everything in a common european engraving is detailed and individualized everything in a japanese drawing is impersonal and suggestive the former reveals no law it is a study of particularities the latter invariably teaches something of law 
and suppresses particularities except in their relation to law. One may often hear Japanese say that Western art is too realistic, and the judgment contains truth. But the realism in it which offends Japanese taste, especially in the matter of facial expression, is not found fault with merely because of minuteness of detail. Detail in itself is not condemned by any art, and the highest art is that in which detail is most exquisitely elaborated. The art which saw the divine, which rose above nature's best, which discovered supramundane ideals, for animal and even floral shape, was characterized by the sharpest possible perfection of detail. And in the higher Japanese art, as in the Greek, the use of detail aids, rather than opposes, the aspirational aim. What most displeases in the realism of our modern illustration is not multiplicity of detail, but, as we shall presently see, signification of detail. The queerest fact about the suppression of physiognomical detail in Japanese art is that this suppression is most evident just where we should least expect to find it, namely, in those creations called This Miserable World Pictures. Yukiyo-i, or, to use a corresponding Western term, Pictures of this Veil of Tears. For although the artists of this school have really given us pictures of a very beautiful and happy world, they professed to reflect truth. One form of truth they certainly presented, but after a manner at variance with our common notions of realism. The Yukiyo-yi artists drew actualities, but not repellent or meaningless actualities, proving his rank even more by his refusal than by his choice of subjects. He looked for dominant laws of contrast and color, for the general character of nature's combinations, for the order of the beautiful as it was and is. Otherwise his art was in no sense aspirational, it was the art of the larger comprehension of things as they are. Thus he was rightly a realist, notwithstanding that his realism appears only in the study of constants, generalities, and types, and as expressing the synthesis of common fact and the systemization of natural law, this Japanese art is by its method scientific in the true sense. The higher art, the aspirational art, whether Japanese or old Greek, is, on the contrary, essentially religious by its method. Where the scientific and the aspirational extremes of art touch, one may expect to find some universal aesthetic truth recognized by both. They agree in their impersonality. They refuse to individualize. And the lesson of the very highest art that ever existed suggests the true reason for this common refusal. What does the charm of an antique head express, whether in marble, gem, or mural painting, for instance, that marvellous head of Leocothia, which prefaces the work of Winkelmann. Needless to seek the reply from works of mere art critics. Science alone can furnish it. You will find it in Herbert Spencer's essay on personal beauty. The beauty of such a head signifies a superhuman perfect development and balance of the intellectual faculties. All those variations of feature constituting what we call expression represent departures from a perfect type just in proportion as they represent what is termed character. And they are, or ought to be, more or less disagreeable or painful because the aspects which please us are the outward correlatives of inward perfections, and the aspects which displease us are the outward correlatives of inward imperfections. Mr. Spencer goes on to say that although there are often grand natures behind plain faces, and although fine countenances frequently hide small souls, these anomalies do not destroy the general truth of the law any more than the perturbations of planets destroy the general ellipticity of their orbits. Both Greek and Japanese art recognized the physiognomical truth which Mr. Spencer put into the simple formula, expression is feature in the making. The highest art, Greek art, rising above the real to reach the divine, gives us the dream of feature perfected. Japanese realism, so much larger than our own as to be still misunderstood, gives us only feature in the making, or rather, the general law of feature in the making. 6. Thus we reach the common truth recognized equally by Greek art and by Japanese art, namely, the non-moral significance of individual expression and our admiration of the art reflecting personality is, of course, non-moral, 
since the delineation of individual imperfection is not in the ethical sense a subject for admiration although the facial aspects which really attract us may be considered the outward correlatives of inward perfections or of approaches to perfections we generally confess an interest in physiognomy which by no means speaks to us of inward moral perfections but rather suggests perfections of the reverse order this fact is manifested even in daily life when we exclaim what force on seeing a head with prominent bushy brows incisive nose deep-set eyes and a massive jaw we are indeed expressing our recognition of force but only of the sort of force underlying instincts of aggression and brutality when we commend the character of certain strong aquiline faces certain so-called roman profiles we are really commending the traits that mark a race of prey it is true that we do not admire faces in which only brutal or cruel or cunning traits exist but it is true also that we admire the indications of obstinacy aggressiveness and harshness when united with certain indications of intelligence it may even be said that we associate the idea of manhood with the idea of aggressive power more than with the idea of any other power whether this power be physical or intellectual we estimate it in our popular preferences at least above the really superior powers of the mind and call intelligent cunning by the euphemism of shrewdness probably the manifestation in some modern human being of the greek ideal of masculine beauty would interest the average observer less than a face presenting an abnormal development of traits the reverse of noble since the intellectual significance of perfect beauty could be realized only by persons capable of appreciating the miracle of a perfect balance of the highest possible human faculties in modern art we look for the feminine beauty which appeals to the feeling of sex or for that child beauty which appeals to the instincts of parenthood and we should characterize real beauty in the portrayal of manhood not only as unnatural but as effeminate war and love are still the two dominant tones in that reflection of modern life which our serious art gives but it will be noticed that when the artist would exhibit the ideal of beauty or of virtue he is still obliged to borrow from antique knowledge as a borrower he is never quite successful since he belongs to a humanity in many respects much below the ancient greek level a german philosopher has well said the resuscitated greeks would with perfect truth declare our works of art in all departments to be thoroughly barbarous how could they be otherwise in an age which openly admires intelligence less because of its power to create and preserve than because of its power to crush and destroy why this admiration of capacities which we should certainly not like to have exercised against ourselves largely no doubt because we admire what we wish to possess and we understand the immense value of aggressive power intellectual especially in the great competitive struggle of modern civilization as reflecting both the trivial actualities and the personal emotionalism of western life our art would be found ethically not only below greek art but even below japanese greek art expressed the admiration of a race toward the divinely beautiful and the divinely wise japanese art reflects the simple joy of existence perception of natural law in form and color the perception of natural law in change and the sense of life made harmonious by social order and by self-suppression modern western art reflects the thirst of pleasure the idea of life as a battle for the right to enjoy and the unamiable qualities which are indispensable to success in the competitive struggle it has been said that the history of western civilization was written in western physiognomy it is at least interesting to study western facial expression through oriental eyes i have frequently amused myself by showing european or american illustrations to japanese children and hearing their artless comments upon the faces therein depicted a complete record of these comments might prove to have value as well as interest but for present purposes i shall offer only the results of two experiments the first was with a little boy nine years old before whom one evening i placed several numbers of an illustrated magazine after turning over a few of the pages he exclaimed why do foreign artists like to draw horrible things what horrible things i inquired these he said pointing to a group of figures representing voters at the polls why those are not horrible i answered we think those drawings very good but the faces there cannot really be such faces in the world 
we think those are ordinary men really horrible faces we very seldom draw he stared in surprise evidently suspecting that i was not in earnest to a little girl of eleven i showed some engravings representing famous european beauties they do not look bad was her comment but they seem so much like men and their eyes are so big their mouths are pretty the mouth signifies a great deal in japanese physiognomy and the child was in this regard appreciative i then showed her some drawings from life in a new york periodical she asked is it true that there are people like those pictures plenty i said those are good common faces mostly country folk farmers farmers they are like oni demons from the jigoku buddhist hell no i answered there is nothing very bad in those faces we had faces in the west very much worse only to see them she exclaimed i should die i do not like this book i set before her a japanese picture book a book of views of the tokaido she clapped her hands joyfully and pushed my half inspected foreign magazine out of the way End of section six. Section seven of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hahn. Chapter six. Ningyo no Haka. Manyamon had coaxed the child indoors and made her eat. She appeared to be about eleven years old, intelligent, and pathetically docile. Her name was Ine, which means springing rice, and her frail slimness made the name seem appropriate. When she began, under Manyamon's gentle persuasion, to tell her story, I anticipated something queer from the accompanying change in her voice. She spoke in a high, thin, sweet tone, perfectly even, a tone changeless and unemotional as the chanting of the little kettle over its charcoal bed. Not unfrequently in Japan, one may hear a girl or a woman utter something touching or cruel or terrible in just such a steady level, penetrating tone, but never anything indifferent. It always means that the feeling is being kept under control. There were six of us at home, said Ine, mother and father and father's mother, who was very old, and my brother and myself, and a little sister. Father was a hyoguya, a paper hanger. He papered sliding screens and mounted kakemono. Mother was a hairdresser. My brother was apprenticed to a seal cutter. Father and mother did well. Mother made even more money than father. We had good clothes and good food and we never had any real sorrow until father felt sick it was in the middle of the hot season father had always been healthy we did not think that his sickness was dangerous and he did not think so himself but the very next day he died we were very much surprised mother tried to hide her heart and to wait upon her customers as before but she was not very strong and the pain of father's death came too quickly eight days after father's funeral mother also died it was so sudden that everybody wondered then the neighbors told us we must make a ningyo no haka at once or else there would be another death in our house my brother said they were right but he put off doing what they told him perhaps he did not have money enough i do not know but the haka was not made what's a ningyo no haka i interrupted i think manyamon made answer that you have seen many ningyo no haka without knowing what they were they look just like graves of children. It is believed that when two of a family die in the same year, a third also must soon die. There is a saying, always three graves. So when two out of one family have been buried in the same year, a third grave is made next to the graves of those two, and in it is put a coffin containing only a little figure of straw, waraningyo, and over the grave a small jumpstone is set up, bearing a kaimyo. Footnote, the posthumous Buddhist name of the person buried is childed upon the tomb or haka. End of footnote. The priests of the temple to which the graveyard belongs write the kamyo for the little gravestones. By making a ningyo no haka, it is thought that the death may be prevented. We listen for the rest, Ine. The child resumed. There were still four of us, grandmother, brother, myself, and my little sister. My brother was nineteen years old. He had finished his apprenticeship just before father died we thought that was like the pity of the gods for us he had become the head of the house he was very skilful in his business and had many friends therefore he could maintain us he made thirteen n the first month that is very good for a seal cutter one evening he came home sick he said that his head hurt him 
Mother, then, had been dead for forty-seven days. That evening he could not eat. Next morning he was not able to get up. He had a very hot fever. We nursed him as well as we could, and sat up at night to watch by him, but he did not get better. On the morning of the third day of his sickness we became frightened, because he began to talk to Mother. It was the forty-ninth day after Mother's death, the day the soul leaves the house, and Brother spoke of it as if Mother was calling him. Yes, Mother, yes, in a little while I shall come. Then he told us that Mother was pulling him by the sleeve. He would point with his hand and call to us, There she is, there, do you not see her? We would tell him that we could not see anything. Then he would say, Ah, you did not look quick enough. She is hiding now. She has gone down under the floor mats. All the morning he talked like that. At last grandmother stood up and stamped her foot on the floor and reproached mother, speaking very loud. Taka, she said, Taka, what you do is very wrong. When you were alive, we all loved you. None of us ever spoke unkind words to you. Why do you now want to take the boy? You know that he is the only pillar of a house. You know that if you take him, there will not be anyone to take care for the ancestors. You know that if you take him, you will destroy the family name. Oh, Chaka, it is cruel, it is shameful, it is wicked. Grandmother was so angry that all her body trembled. Then she sat down and cried, and I and my little sister cried. But our brother said that mother was still pulling him by the sleeve. When the sun went down, he died. Grandmother wept and stroked us and sang a little song that she made herself. I can remember it still. Oya no nai koto, hamabe no chidori, higori higori ni sode shiboru. Footnote Children without parents, like seagulls of the coast, evening after evening, the sleeves are wrung. The word shidori, indiscriminately applied to many kinds of birds, is here used for seagull. The cries of the seagull are thought to express melancholy and desolation, hence the comparison. The long sleeve of the Japanese robe is used to wipe the eye, as well as to hide the face in moments of grief. To wring the sleeve, that is, to wring the moisture from a tear-drenched sleeve, is a frequent expression in Japanese poetry. End of footnote. So the third grave was made, but it was not a ningyo no haka. And that was the end of our house. We lived with kindred until winter, when grandmother died. She died in the night, when nobody knew. In the morning she seemed to be sleeping, but she was dead. And then I and my little sister were separated. My sister was adopted by a tatamiya, a matmaker, one of father's friends. She is kindly treated. She even goes to school. A fushigi na kotoda, a komata ne, murmured Maniamon. Then there was a moment or two of sympathetic silence. Ine prostrated herself in thanks and rose to depart. As she slipped her feet under the thongs of her sandals, I moved toward the spot where she had been sitting to ask the old man a question. She perceived my intention and immediately made an indescribable sign to Maniemon, who responded by checking me just as I was going to sit down beside him. She wishes, he said, that the master will honorably strike the matting first. But why? I asked in surprise, noticing only that under my unshut feet the spot where the child had been kneeling felt comfortably warm. Maniamon answered, she believes that to sit down upon the place made warm by the body of another is to take into one's life all the sorrow of another person, unless the place be stricken first. Whereat I sat down without performing the rite, and we both laughed. Ine, said Maniamon, the master takes your sorrows upon him. He wants, I cannot venture to render Maniamon's honorifics, to understand the pain of other people. You need not fear for him, Ine. End of section 7《ซิกเกอร์ของกลีนิงส์ในบูดาฟิลด์สนี่คือเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่องราวของการเขียนทุกเรื่อง Takaki ya ni noborite mireba kemuri tatsu. Tami no kamado wa nigiwai nikeri. When I ascend a high place and look about me, lo, the smoke is rising. The cooking ranges of the people are busy. Song of the Emperor Nintoku. One. 
Nearly three hundred years ago, Captain John Serres, visiting Japan in the service of the Right Honourable Company, ye merchants of London trading into ye East Indies, wrote concerning the great city of Osaka, as the name is now transliterated, We found Osaka to be a very great town, as great as London within the walls, with many fair timber bridges of a great height, serving to pass over a river there as wide as the Thames at London. Some fair houses we found there, but not many. It is one of the chief seaports of all Japan, having a castle in it, marvellous large and strong. What Captain Seri said of the Osaka of the seventeenth century is almost equally true of the Osaka of today. It is still a very great city, and one of the chief seaports of all Japan. It contains, according to the Occidental idea, some fair houses. It has many fair timber bridges, as well as bridges of steel and stone, serving to pass over a river as wide as the Thames at London, the Yodogawa, and the castle, marvellous large and strong, built by Hideyoshi after the plan of a Chinese fortress of the Han dynasty, still remains something for military engineers to wonder at, in spite of the disappearance of the many-storied towers and the destruction, in 1868, of the magnificent palace. Osaka is more than 2,500 years old, and therefore one of the most ancient cities of Japan, though its present name, a contraction of Oye no Saka, meaning the high land of the great river, is believed to date back only to the 15th century, before which time it was called Naniwa. Centuries before Europe knew of the existence of Japan, Osaka was the great financial and commercial centre of the empire, and it is that still. Through all the feudal era the merchants of Osaka were the bankers and creditors of the Japanese princes. They exchanged the revenues of rice for silver and gold. They kept in their miles of fireproof warehouses the national stores of cereals, of cotton, and of silk, and they furnished to great captains the sinews of war. Hideyoshi made Osaka his military capital. Ieyasu, jealous and keen, feared the great city, and deemed it necessary to impoverish its capitalists because of their financial power. The Osaka of 1896, covering a vast area, has a population of about 670,000. As to extent and population, it is now only the second city of the empire, but it remains, as Count Okuma remarked in a recent speech, financially, industrially, and commercially superior to Tokyo. Sakai and Hyogo and Kobe are really but its outer ports, and the last named is visibly outgrowing Yokohama. It is confidentially predicted, both by foreigners and by Japanese, that Kobe will become the chief port of foreign trade, because Osaka is able to attract to herself the best business talent of the country. At present, the foreign import and export trade of Osaka represents about $120 million a year, and its inland and coasting trade are immense. Almost everything which everybody wants is made in Osaka, and there are few comfortable Japanese homes in any part of the empire to the furnishing of which Osaka industry has not contributed something. This was probably the case long before Tokyo existed. There survives an ancient song of which the burden runs, Every day to Osaka come a thousand ships. Junks only, in the time when the song was written, steamers also today, and deep-sea travellers of all rigs. Along the wharves you can ride for miles by a seemingly endless array of masts and funnels, though the great trans-Pacific liners and European mail steamers draw too much water to enter the harbour, and receive their Osaka freight at Kobe. But the energetic city, which has its own steamship companies, now proposes to improve its port at a cost of sixteen million dollars. An Osaka with a population of two millions and a foreign trade of at least three hundred million a year 
is not a dream impossible to realize in the next half century i need scarcely say that osaka is the centre of the great trade guilds and the headquarters of those cotton spinning companies whose mills kept running with a single shift twenty-three hours out of the twenty-four turn out double the quantity of yarn per spindle that english mills turn out and from thirty to forty per cent more than the mills of bombay every great city in the world is believed to give a special character to its inhabitants and in japan the man of osaka is said to be recognizable almost at sight i think it can be said that the character of the man of the capital is less marked than that of the man of osaka as in america the man of chicago is more quickly recognized than the new yorker or bostonian he has a certain quickness of perception ready energy and general air of being well up to date or even a little in advance of it which represent the results of industrial and commercial intercompetition at all events the osaka merchant or manufacturer has a much longer inheritance of business experience than his rival of the political capital perhaps this may partly account for the acknowledged superiority of osaka commercial travellers a modernized class offering some remarkable types while journeying by rail or steamer you may happen to make the casual acquaintance of a gentleman whose nationality you cannot safely decide even after some conversation he is dressed with the most correct taste in the latest and best mode he can talk to you equally well in french german or english he is perfectly courteous but able to adapt himself to the most diverse characters he knows europe and he can give you extraordinary information about parts of the far east which you have visited and also about other parts of which you do not even know the names as for japan he is familiar with the special products of every district their comparative merits their history his face is pleasing nose straight or slightly aquiline mouth veiled by a heavy black moustache the eyelids alone give you some right to suppose that you are conversing with an oriental such is one type of the osaka commercial traveller of eighteen ninety six a being as far superior to the average japanese petty official as a prince to a lackey should you meet the same man in his own city you would probably find him in japanese costume dressed as only a man of fine taste can learn how to dress and looking rather like a spaniard or italian in disguise than a japanese two from the reputation of osaka as a centre of production and distribution one would imagine it the most modernized the least characteristically japanese of all japanese cities but osaka is the reverse fewer western costumes are to be seen in osaka than in any other large city of japan no crowds are more attractively robed and no streets more picturesque than those of the great mart Osaka is supposed to set many fashions, and the present ones show an agreeable tendency to a variety of tint. When I first came to Japan, the dominant colors of male costume were dark, especially dark blue, any crowd of men usually presenting a mass of this shade. Today the tones are lighter, and grays, warm grays, steel grays, bluish grays, purplish grays, seem to predominate but there are also many pleasing variations bronze colors gold browns tea colors for example women's costumes are of course more varied but the character of the fashions for adults of either sex indicates no tendency to abandon the rules of severe good taste gay colors appearing only in the attire of children and of dancing girls to whom are granted the privileges of perpetual youth I may observe that the latest fashion in the silk upper dress or haori of geisha is a burning sky blue a tropical color that makes the profession of the wearer distinguishable miles away the higher class geisha however affects sobriety in dress 
I must also speak of the long overcoats or overcloaks worn out of doors in cold weather by both sexes. That of the men looks like an adaptation and modification of our Ulster, and has a little cape attached to it. The material is wool, and the colour usually light brown or grey. That of the ladies, which has no cape, is usually of black broadcloth, with much silk binding, and a colour cut low in front. It is buttoned from throat to feet, and looks decidedly genteel, though left very wide and loose at the back to accommodate the bow of the great heavy silk girdle beneath. Architecturally not less than fashionably, Osaka remains almost as Japanese as anybody could wish. Although some wide thoroughfares exist, most of the streets are very narrow, even more narrow than those of Kyoto. There are streets of three-story houses and streets of two-story houses, but there are square miles of houses one story high. The great mass of the city is an agglomeration of low wooden buildings with tiled roofs. Nevertheless, the streets are more interesting, brighter, quainter in their signs and sign paintings than the streets of Tokyo, and the city as a whole is more picturesque than Tokyo because of its waterways. It has not inaptly been termed the Venice of Japan, for it is traversed in all directions by canals, besides being separated into several large portions by the branchings of the Yorogawa. The streets facing the river are, however, much less interesting than the narrow canals. Anything more curious in the shape of a street vista than the view looking down one of these waterways can scarcely be found in Japan. Still as a mirror surface, the canal flows between high stone embankments supporting the houses, houses of two or three stories, all sparred out from the stonework so that their facades bodily overhang the water. They are huddled together in a way suggesting pressure from behind, and this appearance of squeezing and crowding is strengthened by the absence of regularity in design, no house being exactly like another, but all having an indefinable Far Eastern queerness, a sort of racial character, that gives the sensation of the very far away in place and time. They push out funny little galleries with balustrades, barred, projecting, glassless windows with elfish balconies under them, and rooflets over them like eyebrows, tiers of tiled and tilted awnings, and great eaves which, in certain houses, throw shadows down to the foundation. As most of the timber work is dark, either with age or staining, the shadows look deeper than they really are. Within them you catch glimpses of balcony pillars, bamboo ladders from gallery to gallery, polished angles of joinery, all kinds of jutting things. At intervals you can see mattings hanging out, and curtains of split bamboo, and cotton hangings with big white ideographs upon them, and all this is faithfully repeated upside down in the water. The colours ought to delight an artist, umbers and chocolates and chestnut browns of old polished timber, warm yellows of mattings and bamboo screens, creamy tones of stuccoed surfaces, cool greys of tiling. The last such vista I saw was bewitched by a spring haze. It was early morning. Two hundred yards from the bridge on which I stood, the house fronts began to turn blue. Farther on they were transparently vapoury, and yet farther they seemed to melt away suddenly into the light, a procession of dreams. I watched the progress of a boat propelled by a peasant in straw hat and straw coat, like the peasants of the old picture books. Boat and man turned bright blue and then grey, and then before my eyes glided into nirvana. The notion of immateriality so created by that luminous haze was supported by the absence of sound, for these canal streets are as silent as the streets of shops are noisy. No other city in Japan has so many bridges as Osaka. Wards are named after them and distances marked by them, reckoning always from Koraibashi, the bridge of the Koreans, 
as a center. Osaka people find their way to any place most readily by remembering the name of the bridge nearest to it. But as there are 189 principal bridges, this method of reckoning can be of little service to a stranger. If a businessman, he can find whatever he wants without learning the names of the bridges. Osaka is the best ordered city, commercially, in the empire, and one of the best ordered in the world. It has always been a city of guilds, and the various trades and industries are congregated still, according to ancient custom, in special districts or particular streets. Thus, all the money changers are in Kitahama, the Lombard Street of Japan. The dry goods trade monopolizes Honmachi. The timber merchants are all in Nagabori and Nishiyokobori. The toy makers are in Minami Kiyuhojimachi and Kitamidomae. The dealers in metal wares have Andojibashi Dori to themselves. The druggists are in Doshiomachi and the cabinet makers in Hachimansuji. So with many other trades, and so with the places of amusement. The theatres are in the Dotombori, the jugglers, singers, dancers, acrobats and fortune-tellers in the Senichimae, close by. The central part of Osaka contains many very large buildings, including theatres, refreshment houses and hotels having a reputation throughout the country. The number of edifices in western style is nevertheless remarkably small. There are indeed between eight and nine hundred factory chimneys, but the factories, with few exceptions, are not constructed on western plans. The really foreign buildings include a hotel, a prefectural hall with a mansard roof, a city hall with a classical porch of granite pillars, a good modern post office, a mint, an arsenal, and sundry mills and breweries. But these are so scattered and situated that they really make no particular impression at variance with the far eastern character of the city. However, there is one purely foreign corner, the old concession, dating back to a time before Kobe existed. Its streets were well laid out and its buildings solidly constructed, but for various reasons it has been abandoned to the missionaries, only one of the old firms, with perhaps an agency or two, remaining open. This deserted settlement is an oasis of silence in the great commercial wilderness. Footnote. The foreign legations left Osaka to take shelter at Kobe in 1868, during the Civil War, for they could not be very well protected by their men of war in Osaka. Kobe once settled, and the advantages offered by its deep harbour settled the fate of the Osaka concession. End footnote. No attempts have been made by the native merchants to imitate its styles of building. Indeed, no Japanese city shows less favour than Osaka to occidental architecture. This is not through want of appreciation, but because of economical experience. Osaka will build in western style, with stone, brick and iron, only when and where the advantage of so doing is indubitable. There will be no speculation in such constructions as there has been at Tokyo. Osaka goes slow and invests upon certainties. When there is a certainty, her merchants can make remarkable offers, like that to the government two years ago of fifty-six million dollars for the purchase and reconstruction of a railway. Of all the houses in Osaka, the office of the Asai Shimbun most surprised me. The Asai Shimbun is the greatest of Japanese newspapers, perhaps the greatest journal published in any Oriental language. It is an illustrated daily, conducted very much like a Paris newspaper, publishing a feuilleton, translations from foreign fiction, and columns of light, witty chatter about current events. It pays big sums to popular writers, and spends largely for correspondence and telegraphic news. Its illustrations, now made by a woman, offer as full a reflection of all phases of Japanese life, old or new, 
as punch gives of english life it uses perfecting presses charters special trains and has a circulation reaching into most parts of the empire so i certainly expected to find the asai shimbun office one of the handsomest buildings in osaka but it proved to be an old-time samurai yashiki about the most quiet and modest-looking place in the whole district where it was situated i must confess that all this sober and sensible conservatism delighted me the competitive power of japan must long depend upon her power to maintain the old simplicity of life three osaka is the great commercial school of the empire from all parts of japan lads are sent there to learn particular branches of industry or trade there are hosts of applications for any vacancy and the businessmen are said to be very cautious in choosing their dechi or apprentice clerks careful inquiries are made as to the personal character and family history of applicants no money is paid by the parents or relatives of the apprentices the term of service varies according to the nature of the trade or industry but it is generally quite as long as the term of apprenticeship in europe and in some branches of business it may be from twelve to fourteen years such i am told is the time of service usually exacted in the dry goods business and the detchi in a dry goods house may have to work fifteen hours a day with not more than one holiday a month during the whole of his apprenticeship he receives no wages whatever nothing but his board lodging and absolutely necessary clothing his master is supposed to furnish him with two robes a year and to keep him in sandals or geta perhaps on some great holiday he may be presented with a small gift of pocket money but this is not in the bond when his term of service ends however his master either gives him capital enough to begin trade for himself on a small scale or finds some other way of assisting him substantially by credit for instance many detchi marry their employers daughters in which event the young couple are almost sure of getting a good start in life the discipline of these long apprenticeships may be considered a severe test of character though a detchi is never addressed harshly he has to bear what no european clerk would bear he has no leisure no time of his own except the time necessary for sleep he must work quietly but steadily from dawn till late in the evening he must content himself with the simplest diet must keep himself neat and must never show ill temper wild oats he is not supposed to have and no chance is given him to sow them some that she never even leave their shop night or day for months at a time sleeping on the same mats where they sit in business hours the trained salesmen in the great silk stores are especially confined within doors and their unhealthy pallor is proverbial year after year they squat in the same place for twelve or fifteen hours every day and you wonder why their legs do not fall off like those of daruma footnote in japanese popular legend daruma bodhidharma the great buddhist patriarch and missionary is said to have lost his legs during a meditation which lasted uninterruptedly for nine years a common child's toy is a comical figure of daruma without legs and so weighted within that no matter how thrown down it will always assume an upright position End footnote. occasionally there are moral breakdowns perhaps a detchi misappropriates some of the shop money and spends the same in riotous living perhaps he does even worse but whatever the matter may be he seldom thinks of running away if he takes a spree he hides himself after it for a day or two then returns of his own accord to confess and ask pardon he will be forgiven for two three perhaps even four escapades provided that he shows no sign of a really evil heart and be lectured about his weakness in its relation to his prospects to the feeling of his family to the honour of his ancestors 
and to business requirements in general. The difficulties of his position are kindly considered, and he is never discharged for a small misdemeanor. A dismissal would probably ruin him for life, and every care is taken to open his eyes to certain dangers. Osaka is really the most unsafe place in Japan to play the fool in. Its dangerous and vicious classes are more to be feared than those of the capital, and the daily news of the great city furnishes the apprentice with terrible examples of men reduced to poverty or driven to self-destruction through neglect of those very rules of conduct which it is part of his duty to learn. In cases where detchi are taken into service at a very early age, and brought up in the shop almost like adopted sons, a very strong bond of affection between master and apprentice is sometimes established. Instances of extraordinary devotion to masters, or members of masters' households, are often reported. Sometimes the bankrupt merchant is re-established in business by his former clerk. Sometimes, again, the affection of a detchi may exhibit itself in strange extremes. Last year there was a curious case. The only son of a merchant, a lad of twelve, died of cholera during the epidemic. A detchi of fourteen, who had been much attached to the dead boy, committed suicide shortly after the funeral by throwing himself down in front of a train. He left a letter, of which the following is a tolerably close translation, the selfish pronouns being absent in the original. Very long time in, August help received, honourable mercy even, not in words to be declared. Now going to die, unfaithful in excess, yet another state in, making rebirth, honourable mercy will repay. Spirit anxious only in the matter of little sister O Noto, with humble salutation that she be honourably seen to supplicate. To the August Lord Master, from Mano Yoshimatsu. 4. It is not true that old Japan is rapidly disappearing. It cannot disappear within at least another hundred years. Perhaps it will never entirely disappear. Many curious and beautiful things have vanished, but old Japan survives in art, in faith, in customs and habits, in the hearts and the homes of the people. It may be found everywhere by those who know how to look for it, and nowhere more easily than in this great city of shipbuilding, watchmaking, beer brewing and cotton spinning. I confess that I went to Osaka chiefly to see the temples, especially the famous Tennoji. Tennoji, or more correctly, Shitennoji, the temple of the four Deva kings, is one of the oldest Buddhist temples in Japan. It was founded nearly in the seventh century by Umayado no Oji, now called Shotoku Taishi, son of the Emperor Yome and Prince Regent under the Empress Suiko, 572 to 621 AD. He has been well called the Constantine of Japanese Buddhism, for he decided the future of Buddhism in the empire, first by a great battle in the reign of his father, Yome Tenno, and afterwards by legal enactments and by the patronage of Buddhist learning. The previous emperor, Bitatsu Tenno, had permitted the preaching of Buddhism by Korean priests and had built two temples. But under the reign of Yome, one Mononobe no Moriya, a powerful noble and a bitter opponent of the foreign religion, rebelled against such tolerance, burned the temples, banished the priests, and offered battle to the imperial forces. These, tradition says, were being driven back when the emperor's son, then only sixteen years old, vowed, if victorious, to build a temple to the four Deva kings. Instantly at his side in the fight there towered a colossal figure from before whose face the powers of Moriya broke and fled away. The rout of the enemies of Buddhism was complete and terrible, and the young prince, thereafter called Shotoku Taishi, kept his vow. The temple of Tennoji was built, and the wealth of the rebel Moriya applied to its maintenance. 
in that part of it called the Kondo, or Hall of Gold, Shotoku Taishi enshrined the first Buddhist image ever brought to Japan, a figure of Nyo Irin Kwanon, or Kwanon of the Circle of Wishes, and the statue is still shown to the public on certain festival days. The tremendous apparition in the battle is said to have been one of the four kings, Bishamon, by Saravana, worshipped to this day as a giver of victory. The sensation received on passing out of the bright, narrow, busy streets of shops into the mouldering courts of Tenoji is indescribable. Even for a Japanese, I imagine it must be like a sensation of the supernatural, a return in memory of the life of twelve hundred years ago to the time of the earliest Buddhist mission work in Japan symbols of the faith that elsewhere had become for me conventionally familiar here seemed but half familiar exotic prototypal and things never before seen gave me the startling notion of a time and place out of existing life as a matter of fact very little remains of the original structure of the temple parts have been burned parts renovated but the impression is still very peculiar because the rebuilders and the renovators always followed the original plans made by some great Korean or Chinese architect. Any attempt to write of the antique aspect, the queer melancholy beauty of the place, would be hopeless. To know what Tenoji is, one must see the weirdness of its decay, the beautiful neutral tones of old timbers, the fading spectral greys and yellows of wall surfaces, the eccentricities of disjointing, the extraordinary carvings under eaves, carvings of waves and clouds and dragons and demons, once splendid with lacquer and gold, now time whitened to the tint of smoke, and looking as if about to curl away like smoke and vanish. The most remarkable of these carvings belong to a fantastic five-storied pagoda, now ruinous, Nearly all the brazen wind bells suspended to the angles of its tiers of roofs have fallen. Pagoda and temple proper occupy a quadrangular court surrounded by an open cloister. Beyond are other courts, a Buddhist school, and an immense pond peopled by tortoises and crossed by a massive stone bridge. There are statues and stone lamps and lions and an enormous temple drum, there are booths for the sale of toys and oddities. There are resting places where tea is served, and cake stands where you can buy cakes for the tortoises, or for a pet deer which approaches the visitor, bowing its sleek head to beg. There is a two-storied gateway guarded by huge images of the Ni-o, Ni-o with arms and legs muscled like the limbs of kings in the Assyrian sculptures, and bodies speckled all over with little balls of white paper spat upon them by the faithful. There is another gateway whose chambers are empty. Perhaps they once contained images of the four Deva kings. There are ever so many curious things, but I shall only venture to describe two or three of my queerest experiences. First of all, I found the confirmation of a certain suspicion that had come to me as I entered the temple precincts, the suspicion that the forms of worship were peculiar as the buildings. I can give no reason for this feeling. I can only say that, immediately after passing the outer gate, I had a premonition of being about to see the extraordinary in religion as well as in architecture. And I presently saw it in the bell tower a two-storey Chinese-looking structure, where there is a bell called the Indo no Kane, or Guiding Bell, because its sounds guide the ghosts of children through the dark. The lower chamber of the bell tower is fitted up as a chapel. At the first glance I noticed only that a Buddhist service was going on. I saw tapers burning, the golden glimmer of a shrine, incense smoking, a priest at prayer, women and children kneeling. But as I stopped for a moment before the entrance to observe the image in the shrine, I suddenly became aware of the unfamiliar, the astonishing. On shelves and stands at either side of the shrine, 
and above it and below it and beyond it were ranged hundreds of children's ehai or mortuary tablets and with them thousands of toys little dogs and horses and cows and warriors and drums and trumpets and pasteboard armour and wooden swords and dolls and kites and masks and monkeys and models of boats and baby tea-sets and baby furniture and whirligigs and comical images of the gods of good fortune toys modern and toys of fashion forgotten toys accumulated through centuries toys of whole generations of dead children from the ceiling and close to the entrance hung down a great heavy bell rope nearly four inches in diameter and of many colours the rope of the indo kane and that rope was made of the bibs of dead children yellow blue scarlet purple bibs and bibs of all intermediate shades the ceiling itself was invisible hidden from view by hundreds of tiny dresses suspended dresses of dead children little boys and girls kneeling or playing on the matting beside the priest had brought toys with them to be deposited in the chapel before the tablet of some lost brother or sister every moment some bereaved father or mother would come to the door pull the bell rope throw some copper money on the matting and make a prayer every time the bell sounds some little ghost is believed to hear perhaps even to find its way back for one more look at loved toys and faces the plaintive murmur of namu amida butsu the clanging of the bell the deep humming of the priest's voice reciting the sutras the tinkle of falling coin the sweet heavy smell of incense the passionless golden beauty of the buddha in his shrine the colorific radiance of the toys the shadowing of the baby dresses the variegated wonder of that bell rope of bibs the happy laughter of the little folk at play on the floor all made for me an experience of weird pathos never to be forgotten not far from the bell tower is another curious building which shelters a sacred spring in the middle of the floor is an opening perhaps ten feet long by eight wide surrounded by a railing looking down over the railing you see in the dimness below a large stone basin into which water is pouring from the mouth of a great stone tortoise black with age and only half visible its hinder part reaching back into the darkness under the floor this water is called the spring of the tortoise kame i sui the basin into which it flows is more than half full of white paper countless slips of white paper each bearing in chinese text the kaimyo or buddhist posthumous name of a dead person in a matted recess of the building sits a priest who for a small fee writes the kaimyo the purchaser relative or friend of the dead puts one end of the written slip into the mouth of a bamboo cup or rather bamboo joint fixed at right angles to the end of a long pole by aid of this pole he lowers the paper with the written side up to the mouth of the tortoise and holds it under the gush of water repeating a buddhist invocation the while till it is washed out into the basin when i visited the spring there was a dense crowd and several kaimyo were being held under the mouth of the tortoise numbers of pious folk meantime waiting with papers in their hands for a chance to use the poles the murmuring of namu amida butsu was itself like the sound of rushing water i was told that the basin becomes filled with kaimyo every few days then it is emptied and the papers burned if this be true it is a remarkable proof of the force of buddhist faith in this busy commercial city for many thousands of such slips of paper would be needed to fill the basin it is said that the water bears the names of the dead and the prayers of the living to shotoku taishi who uses his powers of intercession with amida on behalf of the faithful in the chapel called the taishi do there are statues of shotoku taishi and his attendants 
the figure of the prince seated upon a chair of honour is life-sized and coloured he is attired in the fashion of twelve hundred years ago wearing a picturesque cap and chinese or korean shoes with points turned up one may see the same costume in the designs upon very old porcelains or very old screens but the face in spite of its drooping chinese moustaches is a typical japanese face dignified kindly passionless i turned from the faces of the statues to the faces of the people about me to see the same types to meet the same quiet half curious inscrutable gaze end of section eight